Thank you. It makes it easier. Now, number one, obviously, this is totally informal, and anybody can ask me anything. But, but we're going to talk about we, what I was assigned was two topics. One, hereditary angioedema, which is a topic where the disease is extremely well known, and the treatment has been absolutely led to virtual cure for most people. Um, now, there aren't a whole lot of people at the Immunodeficiency Foundation who are interested in hereditary angioedema, and the reason is that there's a Hereditary Angioedema Association, which has really done a terrific job of gathering together information on all the patients, getting the patients together, and in fact, they're going to have a, they had a meeting in Orlando a year and a half ago, they're going to have a meeting in Denver uh, this fall. Most of the hereditary angioedema crowd are sort of linked into that group. Uh, and they really are a very knowledgeable group. The hereditary angioedema business is particularly interesting to the pharmaceutical companies because, in fact, um, many different drugs have been worked out. They all are remarkably effective. And so this is a very different situation than the, than the situation that some of you have heard about with chronic granulomatous disease, for example, or with Scott Alder syndrome, where people are laboriously figuring out, A, what the defects are, and a lot of advances have been made there. But then the next question you get to is how do you correct the defects? And in fact, in hereditary angioedema, we know the answer. We've made the drugs that correct the defects. And the only question that people are left with is how do you put in the right gene? But people can lead a perfectly normal, perfectly <coughs> healthy life. That is not true for chronic granulomatous disease. It's not true for uh, wiscott olbert syndrome. And so the hereditary angioedema folks are sort of gathered together uh, to, to uh, uh, sort of uh, celebrate their good luck, uh, but also to figure out the little things that are going wrong that they think they can deal with. So the first talk we're going to deal with is hereditary angioedema, and it's very straightforward from my point of view as a physician who takes care of those patients. I also was asked to talk about complement deficiencies. This is an area which also is not well represented in the Immunodeficiency Foundation because it's not well understood. Um, we have made enormous advances in understanding in the last few years. But because it's not well understood, in fact, there are almost no people working on it. There are no drug companies working on it. There are no physician scientists working on it. It's an area where the Europeans are doing more than the Americans. And changes will be made that are very big changes uh, over the next few years. Uh, the reason that I say that changes will be made is were you to ask uh, the people who run this immunodeficiency foundation, they would say, ah, there aren't very many complement deficiencies. It turns out that many of the diseases that we take for granted as not being understood turn out to be complement-related diseases. And the way it's found out, for the most part, has been genetic studies rather than complement studies. Uh, so that's a totally different subject. Fifteen years ago, these two subjects would have been considered part and parcel of the same problem. Now we know it's not true. We know it's completely different systems. So let's go through the one that's straightforward. Hereditary angioedema, it's a pleasure to talk about it. And the reason it's a pleasure to talk about it is there aren't too many diseases in this institution or in this, uh, 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 that they're talking about uh, this week that are completely understood and completely cured for most people. And this is one. So let's start with what is hereditary angioedema. So hereditary angioedema has actually been known since the 1800s. And it's been known that there are some people who get this kind of swelling of a hand, the swelling in the lower, uh, let's see if I have a pointer, the swelling here uh, of the lower hand is really pretty impressive. And in fact, it can lead to such severe swelling that I've seen patients uh, operated on to let the fluid out of their hand because in fact, the feeling was that they would lose their hand. Um, so hand swells up, swells up for a day and a half. Yeah, sure, anybody can break in any time. It's almost always unilateral. It is. Yeah. In fact, when it's not, oh. if it's symmetrical, 
both hands swell up, both feet swell up, it's probably not hereditary angioedema. This swelling uh, is almost, now it can go from one hand to another, you can have both hands swell up, but if you ask these people, do you ever get a hand swollen or a foot swollen, the answer is yes. Now these people have this swelling that comes out of the clear blue sky for the most part. Uh, there are things that we'll talk about that can bring on the swelling in some people, but many times it just comes out of the clear blue sky. Uh, this, as we know now, is a hereditary disease, and I'll get into it. Uh, but this, um, as you can see, if you have the hand that looks like the one in the lower uh, right side of my screen, um, you have a problem. If you're going to go to work, if you have to use a computer, if you have to cook, if you have to do anything, you can't. This swelling usually gets worse for a day and a half and then very slowly resolves. Sometimes it moves from hand to foot. Sometimes it moves from one hand to another. So this is one of the problems that people get. The next thing that they get, and the reason that they actually wind up with most physicians, is shown in this slide uh, of one of my patients. Um, and it's not a slide that's clear to people who aren't physicians, but what you can see, let's see if I can point it out to a certain extent, uh, the GI tract should not look like this. These are folds of bowel that are swollen. And in fact, they're swollen just like the folds, uh, just like the hand is swollen. And again, it tends to get worse for a day and a half and then better for a day and a half. Now, this turns out to lead to excruciating pain. So these patients are in such pain that they can't stand it. And often they'll go to an emergency room and they'll see a surgeon. And this is a rare disease. The surgeon may never have seen a case of this. But he knows that if he sees somebody with this kind of abdominal pain, it usually means they've got something going on in their abdomen. So these people go to the OR. Uh, and basically they get their appendix taken out. They get their gallbladder taken out. Uh, they get something taken out. But in fact, it's not the reason for the pain, and the pain doesn't go away uh, with the operation. And the next time it comes along, it'll come along again. Now, some of these patients have one or two or three attacks a year. But some of them have one or two attacks a month, or even three or four, the rare patient. And these patients' lives are completely ruined. I've had patients who knew what their disease was, who knew how to treat it, who had the medications available to treat it, who had abdominal pain, and it was so severe they couldn't even get to an emergency room. They had to have an ambulance come, pick them up, put them on a stretcher, and take them in. Now, with the medicines we have available, and we'll get to it, uh, the new medicines will cure a patient like this in an hour. But in fact, you've got to have the right diagnosis, and you've got to know what you're treating. One of the patients who had a hand, like the one I showed you before, uh, came into our emergency room. So this is a place where we see these patients regularly, where we know the disease, and the, uh, the physicians in the emergency room did not know what they were dealing with. But they did know that the patient might lose, in this case, her hand. And so they sent her to the OR to let out the fluid. And they made incisions in her hand to let out the fluid. If they had made the right diagnosis, she would have been cured in an hour. But they didn't make the right diagnosis. Uh, and so this is an easy diagnosis to make. But you've got to know what you're looking for. And since it's a rare disease, you often don't make the right diagnosis. Now, some of these patients have something that looks like circles on the skin. Um, at the start of an attack, it's called erythema marginatum. It's interesting because it goes with rheumatic disease, and we have no idea what it's about. This is one of my patients. This is a, on, on the left is a picture of her taken by a photographer uh, when she was well. And on the right is a picture taken by her husband in those days with a Polaroid camera when she was not so well. Uh, and it doesn't take a lot of imagination to understand that if that swelling were to extend into her airway, she might choke to death. And when we describe the first group of patients with this disease, we ask them, how many members of your family, since it's a hereditary disease, with this illness choked to death? And the answer was a third. So this is a big deal. Now, the truth is that most patients don't have this happen. They don't choke to death because it only happens once or twice or three times in a lifetime. 
uh, but in fact, it's a bad thing when it happens. Now, when we started working on this, there were no treatments. Uh, and so this was a, 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 a really big deal. As I said, there are treatments now. This is a cured disease, and we'll get to it. It's a disease that's understood. It's a disease that where the pathophysiology is completely worked out, and knowing that, it's been possible to develop drugs uh, that basically make the patient's life totally and completely, or pretty close to totally and completely normal. And as you can see, it affects uh, every ethnic group. Uh, this is another one of my patients, and you can see again that this is a pretty big problem if you've got it. Now, a, a, a differential that I want to make is the differential between angioedema and what is called hives or urticaria. The top picture is hives or urticaria, and it's intensely itchy. The swelling of hereditary angioedema in general is not itchy. Now, I've seen patients with itchy swelling with this disease, because if you have one disease, it doesn't prevent you from getting another one. But the truth of the matter is that most of the patients don't itch. So, this is, the, on the left is, is a, 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 a slide which shows what percentage of the various kinds of episodes the patients get. And you can see that, that in this group of, large group of patients, uh, the number of skin episodes, that is hands, feet, genital area can, can swell up, or, uh, is about equal to the number of stomach attacks, but, uh, but the stomach attacks just slightly less. Everything else is much less, including the swelling that affects the, the airways. And this slide on the right simply makes that point again, and we really don't have to spend a lot of time talking about it. Now, this is a rare disease. This is a slide uh, that was put together by a man named Marco Ciccardi, who's in Milan. And Marco Ciccardi is another expert in this disease, and he set up a clinic in Milan where he wanted patients from all over Italy with hereditary angioedema to come in. And after a period of time, one of his fellows uh, published this paper. And first of all, you can see that of all of the patients that they saw, and the number is uh, in the upper corner of the, of the slide, he had almost 800 patients. Only 25% had C1 inhibitor deficiency, and we'll talk about C1 inhibitor deficiency as a manifestation of hereditary angioedema. So 800 patients were sent to him, and only a quarter had the disease that he was looking for. And he's Italy's expert. People will come from all over Italy to see him. The, 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 the area underneath, the one that says 38, that's unknown. They never did figure out what in the world these patients had angioedema for. So, in fact, angioedema is a swelling. It doesn't have to be itchy. In fact, it shouldn't be itchy. It can affect your hands and feet. It's really, it's not uncommon, but, it, it, but in any one particularly allergic person, they'll get angioedema. You can get angioedema with a lot of different situations, but the majority of these situations, it's not hereditary angioedema, and in fact, it's called idiopathic, which really means unknown. Now, the idiopathic group is divided into something called histaminergic and non-histaminergic. Histaminergic means you give the patients high-dose antihistamines and it goes away. And that's the average kind of angioedema that people get. And non-histaminergic means there's still a group of patients out there, and in fact, uh, it's a pretty large group in which we don't know what causes their swelling, and in fact, they don't get better with, uh, with uh, uh, antihistamines, uh, and so we still have some work to do. As I say, it's the hereditary form that we really understand. Now, the, the fact that this is a hereditary disease has actually been known for a long time, and this is one of my families and gives you some clues. The black squares and circles are patients. And so what you see is, first of all, if you look down generations, Every generation has the disease, so it doesn't tend to skip generations. This is what is called an autosomal dominant mode of inheritance. What does that mean? It means that, that you have two chromosomes um, for, for you, every one of your chromosomes is double. When a, a, a male mates with a female, half the chromosomes come from the male, half the chromosomes come from the female, they reassort in the, in the child. So you have double of everything. 
if even one of the genes for this, uh, that can control this disease uh, goes wrong, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail, it means that, that in fact you can get this disease. So that means that the patients for the most part have one from one of their parents normal gene and one abnormal gene from the other parent or it's a new mutation. That's not the common kind of inheritance. In the common kind of inheritance, if you've got one normal gene from either parent, you can get along without the disease. That's not true for this uh, particular disease. And the reason is that the, that the protein is used up, and we'll talk about that. Sometimes you're lucky, and you find out what the protein is, and sometimes you're not lucky, and we'll talk about that with, with regard to this disease, because it turned out that we, were, we and the patients were very lucky. Now, as you can see on this slide from my original patients, and now, in fact, there are hundreds of patients that have been studied, uh, but the slide turned out to be accurate. This is a disease that starts in childhood, but it's almost always very mild in childhood. And with all of the knocks and bruises that kids get, and all the stomach problems that they have, patients and doctors tend to discount it. They say, well, you know, he's got a stomach ache, lots of kids get stomach aches, or he's got swelling, he probably fell, um, and it gets better by itself, so people don't worry about it. And then what happens at puberty is it becomes much more severe. We still don't fully understand that. We know that in women, estrogens make it much more severe. But why males get more severe at the time of puberty, also not understood. As I said, we've got treatment, but we don't have total understanding. Now, there are things that bring on attacks. As I said, most patients have no idea if they're going to have an attack a week from Thursday. Um, and that's terrible, because suppose you want to go to a family reunion, or you want to go to work, or you have a business meeting, and you don't know whether you're going to be well or sick. That's a big problem. But things bring on attacks. One of them is trauma, as I, as I showed in this, uh, in this little representation. So the kind of trauma that brings on an attack in some people, but not all, is the kind of trauma that you get when uh, a woman is using a pair of scissors to cut cloth so that constant pressure on her hand will make the hand swell up. Or somebody is using a power lawnmower, uh, and, uh, and, and that causes a hand to swell up. It's interesting because I don't tell kids who have this disease not to play touch football or football. So it's not that kind of trauma. Nobody understands that one either. Occasionally, infections will bring on an attack. In women, menstruation very commonly brings on attacks. And again, not understood. We'll talk about medications, because there are some medications that turn out to be completely contraindicated and, in fact, are related to this disease. And, in fact, we're in the middle of a study uh, of a series of medications called ACE inhibitors. They're used for hypertension, and they make this disease much worse Knowing that, we've asked the question, can the medications that have been set up that work for this disease work for ACE inhibitor angioedema? And the answer is yes. Hi. Hi. Okay. Uh, and the last thing on this slide is stress. And that's something that's really interesting. When patients are under stress, when something happens uh, that really makes their lives miserable, their attack frequency goes way up. And when we did some of the original trials with, um, uh, with treatment, we had one patient who on treatment got much worse. Most of the patients got much better, but this lady got much worse. And the question was why? Uh, and the answer was her marriage fell apart, her job fell apart. She was under enormous stress. And so she got worse, and it's commonly true. It's true for most patients. Now, okay, uh, in nine, I'm, got, I'm gonna, keep this to the clinical side of things for the most part and not get into science too deeply. But in fact, the reason that we know about this disease is good luck. Uh, ba <laughs> basically, uh, there is a protein in the blood which I have represented with this line um, called C1 inhibitor. And it turns out that this protein is abnormal in this disease. How did we find that out? As I said, it was good luck. There was a guy at Western Reserve whose name was Lee Pao, and he was interested in the complement system. I'm going to talk about complement in the last hour if people are interested, because I think that, in fact, it's the key to a lot of problems. 
and we're just beginning to understand how it's the key. Uh, but everybody's discounted the system. There's almost nobody in America working on it. Uh, but be that as it may, there was this man, Lipa, and he was interested in the complement system, and he was interested in something that inhibits one of the proteins of the complement system, and he named it C1 inhibitor. And he studied it. Now, down the hall, there was an allergist, uh, 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 Virginia Davison, and she was a buddy of his. And he made antibody to this protein, and she said, well, why don't I take your antibody and screen all my patients with all my diseases and see if anything comes up? And so she did, and she discovered that this protein was abnormal in hereditary angioedema. Uh, she was elected to one of the uh, f uh, most prestigious uh, academic organizations in America, the National Academy of Sciences, on the basis of this discovery but it was pure chance. She, it could have been another disease, it could have been whatever. Or if Lipow hadn't made a pro, an antibody to this protein, never would have been found. Now we know how this protein works. It comes as a single chain protein, as I show you here on the left, and buried in that single chain is a highly reactive group. Now everybody recognizes a Pac-Man. If, uh, if an enzyme comes along, it sees a what is called a bait sequence on this protein right here. Uh, and it looks like what it eats. So in fact, it cuts the protein right here. It exposes this group. The group kills the Pac-Man by binding to its mouth. And the, the combination is removed from the circulation. So that's the way the protein works. And it's used up. You can see, you can only use it once. And that's why half the protein, since everybody has one normal gene and one abnormal gene, that's why half the protein is not enough to keep you from getting sick. Now, in fact, this is a, a, a molecular representation of the protein, and it's not really f very hard to see where the, where the bait sequence is. So, in fact, it's actually fairly amazing. It works like a mousetrap. There's a piece of cheese. The mouse comes along and grabs the cheese, and it goes thwack and kills the mouse. Now, the complement system is very complicated. We're going to get to it if anybody's interested in the second hour. In fact, I'm going to talk about it whether you're interested or not. But be that as it may, it has nothing to do with this disease except in one respect, and that is that the C1 inhibitor, which this man had worked on and figured out, has the job of turning off a protein called C1. And that protein's job is to cleave the next two proteins, C4 and C2. For decades, people thought that this had something to do with the development of the disease. It turns out it doesn't. But what it does do is make it really easy to diagnose, because every single hospital can do a C4 level, because it's, it's used to follow lupus. Uh, and so patients w can get a C4 level. It's a cheap test. It can be done in, in an hour if they want to, but it can be certainly done overnight. Uh, and that way, it's an easy way to make the diagnosis. Turns out it has nothing to do with the disease. And that brings me to another point, and that is that the C1 inhibitor has a lot of different functions, which we didn't know when we started this. At the top of this uh, uh, graph, is the fact that, if I can find the pointer, is that it affects many things in the complement system. It has nothing to do with this disease. Then it has a whole, uh, there are a whole bunch of, of systems that have something to do with what is called contact activation. Uh, and that is that when you get a cut, there's a free surface, you have to close that cut. And there are a whole bunch of systems that have to do with, uh, with this so-called contact activation. So one example is the clotting system. You gotta be able to clot that cut so that it doesn't continue to bleed. There's something called the fibrinolytic system. That means that if it clots and it's, and it's uh, stopped bleeding, you have to have a mechanism in your blood for dissolving the clot. And people who have heart attacks often have a clot in their coronary arteries and they don't get dissolved fast enough. So fibrinolysis is part of it. And there's a third system which we really still don't quite understand which turns out to be very important in this disease called the kinin generating system. And there's a peptide generated called bradykinin, which causes your vessels to leak. Now, what in the world it's doing in you now or me now uh, is not at all clear. 
what the C1 inhibitor does is basically determine the set point for teeter totter, for the seesaw. In other words, if the C1 inhibitor is down here, it means that it tends to be on this side. If the C1 inhibitor is down here, it rolls this way. So in fact, it tells you whether you're going to be clotting more, whether you're going to be lysing clots more, whether you're going to be generating kinins more, etc. And that's something that we really still have to work out. Now this is a complicated slide, and it's the only complicated slide you're really <coughs> going to see. Uh, but basically what it says is how the system works. And it's not, when you see the complement system, you realize it's not a complicated system. It looks complicated on this slide. There is a protein in your blood called precalicrine, and basically everybody has it. There's a second protein, as you see by the blue line, it's linked, circulates with the precalicrine called high molecular weight kininogen. If the precalicrine gets activated, it generates an enzyme called calicrine. That enzyme feeds back on the, on the protein that's bound to it, high molecular weight kininogen, and bradykinin is formed. So there are two basic things that you have to remember, at least about hereditary angioedema. Calicrine is an enzyme that's formed. Bradykinin is the ultimate product. The calicrine is controlled by the green squares, which is C1 inhibitor. And there's another thing that controls calicrine formation, and that is these factors which relate to the clotting system. So I said that there's the clotting system, the fibrinolysis system, they're all intimately involved, and sorting all that out is actually what a lot of people are doing at the present time. Ultimately, if the system doesn't get turned off, you get bradykinin. Bradykinin binds to a receptor on your cells in your blood vessels and leads to angioedema. So although this looks very complicated, it really is only two or three proteins, uh, and bradykinin is formed. Now, it took a long time to figure this all out. And the reason it took a long time to figure it all out, when it only took an afternoon for Virginia Donaldson to figure out that C1 inhibitor is important in hereditary angioedema, is that nobody really understands what bradykinin does exactly, it's particularly in an adult, and there are no hospital tests for bradykinin. In fact, there are no hospital tests for any of the proteins in this system except the clotting factors. And, so in, and they only last in the circulation a few seconds. So in fact, it took a long time to figure this out, but the fact that C1 inhibitor was somehow involved took very little time to figure out. So, Treatment of hereditary angioedema, long-term treatment, short-term treatment, and acute treatment. It's, we usually divide it into three phases, and we've got all of them under control at the present time. Thirty years ago, I figured out that a protein, that a, that a drug that was just coming on the market called Danazol would actually work in these patients and prevent them from having attacks, and we published that. Uh, as long ago as 30 years ago. In fact, there was no, it worked prophylactically. If you took a pill every day, you didn't have any attacks, but it didn't work for attacks, so it didn't work for acute treatment. Uh, and this drug turned out to be really very important. Now, it has pluses and minuses, like every drug. There is no such thing as a totally safe drug. And this drug was developed as a female contraceptive. It turns off your periods, so that's one of the things that it does. But also it's a derivative of an androgen. And androgens have lots of uh, side effects. Now it turns out that the, at the doses that most people were on, the androgenic effects were not terrible, but in some people they were. And so in fact we had the first d uh, drug that was useful in prophylaxis. Uh, and it's still used today. Um, I made the decision in the early days uh, that we wouldn't give it to children because I was afraid that it would affect their growth. In fact, some of my European colleagues, particularly my Hungarian colleagues now, I was in Hungary just a few weeks ago, are actually using it in children. Uh, it has some tremendous advantages and some tremendous disadvantages. Let's talk about the disadvantages first. The disadvantages are it's an androgen. And that means that it has the potential of causing androgenic effects, and we'll talk about that. The advantages are tr also terrific. A, it's low dose in most people. B, it's cheap. 
And what you will see is that the new drugs are breathtakingly expensive. The reason that the Europeans are so interested is that they don't have the same kind of health insurance situation that we do. Uh, and so, in fact, getting the new drugs sometimes is a real problem for some of their population. So this is the original treatment results of the first study we did, and it, it just makes a point. And that is, we took a, a bunch of people on, uh, with hereditary angioedema. You'll see there were 88 courses of drug, which were a month long. Uh, you can see that half of them were placebo, half of them were danazole. You can see that, that uh, the patients on danazole had one attack, uh, and the patients on placebo had 43 attacks. Uh, during that period of time. So, in fact, the, the, uh, uh, the drug was very, very effective. And it still is very, very effective. And it's interesting. We'll get to it, but my German colleagues didn't want to use it. Uh, they decided they, they had different drugs, which we're going to talk about in a minute, which we now have, uh, but we didn't have for 20 years. Uh, and so they didn't use Danazole. Uh, and they've come around. They're actually using some of it now. Um, this is a patient who was on... This was the level of C1 inhibitor when she started. She started danazole, and a magical thing happened. Her C1 inhibitor went to normal. We stopped the drug, came back down to the original, started it again, went back up. So this is a drug that can correct the C1 inhibitor in a tiny minority of patients, but this is a very high dose. And so, in fact, we don't use that high dose. We don't try to correct the C1 inhibitor. All we're trying to do is keep patients relatively free of attacks. And it turns out very low doses often will do that. Now, this is, this is side effects of an androgen. And you can see it's a very, very, very long list. The biggest thing in women is weight gain. They hate it. Uh, and I know that there are some people in this room who have taken Danazole who have had weight gain. Yes. No, can be used in males and females. Males have much less trouble. And the reason is obviously they're used to having androgen circulating, so they don't feel differently. Uh, they, 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 they basically tolerate the drug. Um, most of the patients that we see, well, 60% of the patients that we see are female. And the reason is that estrogens make it so much worse. Menstruation makes it a lot worse. Uh, so in fact, uh, the ones that are in trouble are the women that are taking this drug. The males don't notice anything, for the most part. And you can see it can, it can lead to lipid abnormalities, liver function test abnormalities. This is a long list. Um, and, uh, um, and some women simply can't take it. Now, the other thing that's happened in recent years is Lance Armstrong came along, and Barry Bonds came along, and people started to say taking androgen is the worst thing in the world you can do. So I can tell you that there's no woman who comes into my clinic or anybody else's clinic and you say to them, we can give you an androgen and it's relatively low cost, or we can give you one of the new drugs that has no androgenic properties that's very high cost, what would you rather do? Because we always let the patients decide. And the answer 100% is we don't want to be on androgens. Uh, so so uh, uh, this is useful. It's useful in some parts of the world. It's useful in the patients who started before the new drugs came along. And the first of the new drugs came along in 2008, so it was pretty late. Uh, and so people who have been on it for a very long period of time and who don't have any side effects say, well, um, you know, take one pill in the morning, come on. Uh, and they continue on it. Uh, I've had one patient, one of my early patients from that original trial that you saw, who had been on Dan it was a male, been on Danazole for 40 years, um, had no side effects. He went to his allergist and he called me up, this is now three or four months ago, uh, and he said, I've gone to a new allergist and the reason is my old allergist retired, I've been in, you know, seeing this man for 40 years, and my new allergist says it's an exceedingly dangerous drug uh, and that I should be switched to a new agent. Well, he said, you know, I've been on the drug for 40 years. Do you think that's a good idea? <laughs> and I said, stay with it. <laughs> so new therapies were needed. The androgens don't work for 48 hours, and they didn't work for acute attacks. They, were, they had to be given orally. Uh, and basically, oral is not good if you're having a stomach attack. 
Uh, we never use them in children, and we certainly never use them in pregnancy, where they could cause mal, mal, uh, ro, uh, mal uh, I'm sorry, uh, they could cause, uh, um, <laughs> I'm thinking of a word. Yeah, they could cause mutations. Um, the androgens are ineffective in some people. Um, and the other drugs that were developed, and there is a drug that was developed in Europe called tranexamic acid, also didn't work for 48 hours. These andro many of the drugs were inconvenient to take. There were side toxic side effects, um, and we won't get into fresh frozen plasma at all unless anybody wants to talk about it. So now we have lots of new therapies. Uh, they're all breathtakingly expensive, uh, and they're all, uh, they all work, and they all work about equally well. If you have this disease and you start to have an attack, you can be assured that you're going to get better or start to get better in an hour, an hour and a half, and in two or three hours, it's going to be over. Uh, and in fact, some of them can be used for, for prophylaxis. The, the one that was, that was uh, approved for prophylaxis is this drug called Synrise. Uh, and there's another drug, which is essentially the same drug, which is made by CSL Bering, which of course is one of the sponsors of this meeting. Uh, which, which is used for acute attacks. We're going to talk about all of these drugs uh, very briefly uh, because, if anything, we're running late. So I, say, I showed you this picture before, and I said calocrine works on, uh, on high molecular weight kininogen to release bradykinin. So things that turn off calocrine will be effective. Now, I told you about Virginia Donaldson. Um, at the same time that Virginia, when, shortly after Virginia Donaldson showed this abnormality, the Dutch Red Cross got busy trying to make purified C1 inhibitor. A company in Germany called Bering Pharmaceuticals, which is now CSL Bering, started to make C1 inhibitor because they were, they were purifying proteins from, from plasma. And the American Red Cross decided to make some of the protein. Um, and the American Red Cross was the protein that we used uh, and again, I'll show you, an ex uh, a, a, uh, we first showed that it worked in, in, uh, uh, in 1980, but in 2096, with my good colleague at Harvard, Fred Rosen, and one of my fellows, Tom Waitis, we published this paper in the New England Journal, giving the pr protein intravenously. Uh, and we gave, we did it both in an acute attack and for prophylaxis. The protein goes right up if you give it intravenously, obviously, you just put it in the vein. And then it comes down very rapidly. So in fact, it's a short-lived protein. And that's bad. It means that three days later, we had to give another shot. And three days later, we did give another shot. And you can see you got this sawtooth pattern. I said that C4 is a good way of testing for the effect of the, of the uh, protein. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's, it has nothing to do with the disease but it does have to do with the effectiveness of the protein. And you see it comes back into the normal range and stays in the normal range. And these are placebo uh, uh, patients. Uh, on, uh, the, the placebo didn't do anything. And I won't go into this. It worked in acute attacks as well. So in 1996, we published the fact that we had a protein made from blood that would end attacks and could be used for prophylaxis. Now, you'd think with that kind of information, uh, the disease would be under control, especially since uh, the, the Europeans did not do any studies, but their impression was the same. And that is the Germans with their protein thought it was the same, the Dutch with their protein thought it was the same, and nobody thought they could make any money. <laughs> and guess what? The Europeans refused to send their protein to America when we asked for it, uh, because they didn't want to go under FDA uh, control. Uh, the, the, um, uh, and what happened with the American Red Cross protein was we published our paper saying that it worked in 1980. In 1980, uh, the American Red Cross was faced with a different problem. The problem was AIDS, an HIV virus in their donors. And they said, there are a few people with hereditary angioedema. We're going to forget about them. Uh, there are a lot of people who can get HIV. Remember, they, were, they had hemophiliacs who were getting HIV from infusion of the protein, and so they lost interest completely and never gained interest again. So this is the German product. It's called Baronair. 
Uh, it was first licensed in Germany in 1979, uh, and it was never studied in double-blind study until now, uh, but it was reported on extensively and everybody agreed that it worked. And this is the kind of data that they got in Germany. Uh, they didn't do any double-blind studies, that is looking at controls, but this is treatment, time to relief of abdominal attacks. And you can see what I said is, is about right. By 30 minutes, many of these patients were starting to have a lot of relief. And if you look at the numbers on the left side of that slide, 1,800. Uh, now, this was only uh, 30 or 40 patients. So they had patients having attacks all the time. They weren't getting any kind of prophylactic treatment. They were in pain a lot of the time because they had 1,800 attacks during the time that they were followed. At least they had more than 1,800 if you add up all the numbers but they started to get better in 30 minutes, and by two hours or so, most of them were well. So, they isolated it from pl plasma. The Dutch did the same thing, they isolated it from plasma. And in fact, as early as uh, 1978, they reported one paper in Germany saying that in fact they saw a patient get better. That is the protein that currently is Synrise. It's still made by what was the Dutch Red Cross. The Dutch Red Cross sold it out to another Dutch protein called Sanguine. A heat treatment was added in 1989. A company called Lev Pharmaceuticals bought the protein and shipped it into America. That pharmaceutical company was sold to Vero Pharma. That company was sold by, to Shire, and it's on the market as Synrise. Okay, what do we know about Synrise? Well, no, this is the, uh, the German protein. Let's talk about Synrise for a minute. I'm not going to show you all the data on the fact that these proteins work. They all work. Now, the proteins that are made from blood proteins, like Synrise and the CSL bearing protein, um, uh, Berener, they work. But they have to be given intravenously. And they have short half-lives, as I showed you on that sawtooth graph. That means if you're taking Synrise for prophylaxis, you have to take an intravenous injection maybe twice a week, forever. That is not so convenient. Now, it turns out that almost all the patients have learned to have a member of their family give them the drug, or they've learned to give themselves an intravenous injection. And it turns out it's not so hard to do although you wouldn't believe it, but, but uh, patients with hemophilia do it. Uh, and in fact, I have a lot of patients on Synrise taking this intravenous injection twice a week. And they're free of disease and they're very happy. Uh, and they don't want to stop. The problem, of course, is that doing this year after year after year, twice a week, is getting a little tiring. Um, and the Baronet, which is a similar product, uh, basically can be used to stop attacks. For some reason, the FDA approved one for prophylaxis and one for acute attacks. They're basically the same drug, uh, but, ba but they both have to be given intravenously. And this is the Baronet uh, uh, data. Uh, and as you can see, this is time for, for uh, onset of symptom relief with placebo um, and, and, uh, and 20 units per kilo. And you can see there's a big difference. Now, in fact, the difference is a bigger than the ones shown on these slides. But these are the kinds of data that were obtained during the double-blind study when patients had to find their way to an emergency room and get treated uh, uh, in a certain time frame. Now, Farming is an interesting company. Farming is a company in, uh, in uh, Holland again uh, that basically got the idea of taking human genes which we can do now, we can sequence a human gene and take it and put it in a test tube. And they introduced this gene into rabbits under or the regulatory control, and this is all very complicated, of a bovine casein promoter. What that means is that if a rabbit gets pregnant and starts to generate milk, the human protein comes out in the milk. That's a pretty complicated scenario. And it also turns out that you can purify the human protein from the rabbit's milk. So you've got to get the rabbit pregnant, you've got to milk the rabbit, and you've got to get the protein. Now, how you milk a rabbit, I have no idea. I see tiny little stools. <laughs> but be that as it may, you can buy this protein. It's now been approved by the FDA, and it works. 
And again, it has to be given intravenously. Now the question is, so you'd say, well, their argument is they have an unlimited supply. If you're making the protein from human plasma, you've got to get the human plasma. And our FDA makes some interesting rules. Uh, and the, one of the interesting rules that was made during the AIDS epidemic was that, hu that American plasma is better than anybody else's plasma because we don't have HIV in America. Now, if you think back a long time ago, it was believed that HIV is something that's in, in, uh, 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 in Haiti, uh, and it's not in America. Well, people started to use human plasma, and that law hasn't been changed. So the way it works is we, they collect human plasma, they send it to Holland or to Germany, they then purify the protein, and they send it back to America. So that's the way the system works, uh, and farming says that they have an unlimited supply, uh, but in fact their prices are the same and the advantage of the protein is not any different, and all of these proteins work. Now, knowing that bradykinin causes this disease, there were people who had bradykinin inhibitors on the shelf. Uh, and so they pulled them out, and they looked for treatment of these patients. And the blue line in this uh, uh, slide is, is, a, is an inhibitor of the bradykinin receptor. And in fact, that works too. And it works about the same way, and that's the Shire product called uh, Calbator. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, it's called the Cataband. Uh, and in fact, another protein that somebody worked out blocks calocrine. That's the Calbator product. Uh, and in fact, all these proteins work. They all work in the same time frame, and they all make the patients better. So the the um, and this is uh, this is uh, the uh, calentide. Um, and I can show you the effects of the drugs compared to placebo. This is the, the, uh, this is the uh, Acataband. Its brand name is Firazir. Uh, and as I said, they all work. So now we have problems and advantages. The big problems are they all have some minor side effects. These are really minor side effects. Calbator, the one that blocks the enzyme, uh, causes anaphylaxis in a very tiny number of patients, like 2%. And so when it was approved, they said it has to be given by medical personnel. Uh, the the furazir, the one that blocks the bradykinin receptor, uh, basically doesn't cause anaphylaxis. And so people can carry it around in their purse. And if they start to have an attack, they give themselves a shot. And a half an hour later, an hour later, they're better. So all these drugs work. Uh, they, the only drugs that work uh, for prophylaxis are the, are the intravenous drugs because they last three or four days. These other drugs that, that affect the enzymes or affect the bradykinin receptor only work for minutes. They turn off the disease, and two or three hours later, you're better, but they can't be used for prophylaxis. You can't take them every day. So um, that's the first thing. Both, um, I would say that this is a long list of problems. But as somebody who basically takes care of these patients, this is an extremely minor list of problems. Uh, basically, the plasma products have no risk of infection as far as I'm concerned. They have a theoretical risk. All plasma products have a theoretical risk. But they've been made, being made in Germany for 20 years, and nobody's gotten an infection. Hard to believe that it's a big problem. Um, they're all given IV. That's a major disadvantage. Um, but they don't, people don't make allergy to the protein. They're making the normal protein from that normal gene as well. Uh, the recombinant um, uh, product lasts a little less time in the circulation because rabbits put sugars on the protein slightly differently than human beings. Theoretically, the supply is limited. The small peptides that, that work very quickly on the bradykinin system I've talked about. So the real question is, what are the problems and advantages? The real problem is cost. These proteins are breathtakingly expensive. What do I mean by breathtakingly expensive? If you want to take uh, the drug that's used in prophylaxis, which is this drug called Synrise, you have to plan on spending $700,000 a year. That's a lot of money. Now, we saw 
perhaps 300 patients in, in Orlando a year and a half ago, and we asked the patients, how many can't afford the drug? And the answer was nobody. Every insurance pays for it at this point, so in, because it's a life-threatening illness. So in fact, there was no one in the room who raised their hand, and there were people on Medicaid. So in fact, so far, it's okay. And the companies have all set up non-profit organizations to pay the copay. Because if you think if you have a 20% copay on $500,000, that's $100,000. You don't have the money for that copay. So they'll pay the copay for you to make the money to pay for, that the drug costs. So this is a huge problem. And you think with five drugs that have already been approved, that in fact, uh, the, 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 the costs would start coming down. Hasn't happened. All of the new drugs are as expensive as the old ones. Now, you'd also think that with a relatively minor disease, and I'd have to say it's minor, there may be 10,000 people in America who have this disease, uh, that, that people would become interested in treating things that were uh, perhaps more common. But that really hasn't happened either. So what's new? Uh, well, subcutaneous infusions instead of intravenous infusions of the purified blood protein is under study. It's been under study for two or three years, and I don't understand why. But in, in, in fact, it's much more convenient. Uh, the blood levels are more stable, and it's a lot more convenient to give yourself a subcutaneous injection twice a week than an intravenous injection twice a week. And my guess is that that will happen. Now, the next thing is that people have worked, made something called a monoclonal antibody. How many people in the room know what a monoclonal antibody is? Okay, so a few do. So it turns out that, that the way vaccination works is that you make antibody to a lot of different viruses in the vaccine. So, for example, if you're getting flu vaccine, you make antibody to components of the flu vaccine. Every one of those antibodies is a little bit different, seeing a little bit different part of the flu vaccine. And technology has become so sophisticated that people have learned to isolate the individual cells that make each one of those antibodies and grow them up and make a preparation in a bottle that contains a single antibody. And that's called a monoclonal antibody. And the thing about it is it only recognizes the one thing that that one cell recognized. So if you get a flu vaccine, you have thousands of cells recognizing different parts of the flu vaccine, but every one of those cells only recognizes one little part. And people do this routinely now. It's absolutely amazing. So they made a monoclonal antibody to calocrine, that enzyme that we talked about. And it turns out that that enzyme, that uh, monoclonal antibody, turns off the enzyme and it only requires a subcutaneous injection every two or three weeks. And that's being tested at the present time and is likely to become on the market. So the monoclonal antibody will make it and is likely, again, to be a competitor with all these other drugs uh, that people have been working on. People have been working on, for a decade, on an oral calocrine inhibitor. I said that Danazole, the first drug that I introduced, was an oral drug. It's much easier to take a pill in the morning. Uh, but in fact, it's turned out to be very hard to do that, to make an oral calocrine inhibitor. They're testing one now. Uh, it's not clear that the drug potency is sufficiently high and to take the place of the intravenous injection. People are trying to make monoclonal antibodies to the clotting factors, because in that chart I showed you, the clotting factors have a role in turning on the attacks. Exactly what the role uh, is is not clear. And finally, there's a very sophisticated protein involved with putting things in your genes that turn off certain genes, and they, they are actually trying to turn off the gene for calocrine in people who have a normal gene. Now, if you think about it from the, from the medical point of view, we have five approved treatments. If you think about it from the patient point of view, they can live a perfectly normal life, although it costs a lot of money, and every once in a while they have to treat themselves. Some patients have attacks twice a year. Most patients have many more frequent attacks. Why a drug company would make all of these in increasing number of, of, of treatments when the market is so crowded, I have no idea. But in fact, that is the case. 
And so that's what we're going to talk about for hereditary angioedema. As I say, it's a nice thing to talk about. And the reason is I'll go to this meeting in September. There'll be 100 people with hereditary angioedema, and they'll be happy as clams. And the reason is that unlike most of the patients in the Immunodeficiency Foundation where advances have been made and we can give intravenous immunoglobulin and we can do all kinds of things, um, we haven't cured the disease. We've got kids who we have to deal with one problem and then another problem and then a third problem. And some of the diseases, like the one that was emphasized here, chronic granulomatous disease, uh, which I have some experience with, um, could be heartbreaking. So in fact, this is a disease that's cured. It's a pleasure to talk about it. Uh, and I'll open this up for any discussion that anybody wants. OK. So again, were you to take the people who run the Immunodeficiency Foundation, they would say that there are inherited complement deficiencies, that they're life-threatening, and they're very rare. In fact, a paper appeared a few months ago which said they surveyed all of the complement deficiencies in Europe, all of them and they found 23 patients. Now, the question is, how do you define a complement deficiency? And the way it came out, or the way it has come out, the way people think about it, is we know that a bunch of proteins are important in one system or another, and we look for somebody missing the protein. That is the way we define complement deficiencies and all deficiencies at this meeting. So, I'm going to go into this, and I'm going to try to keep it at a relatively understandable level, which isn't so easy. Uh, and then maybe you'll be one of the people who goes out and says to the company, why don't you try to make one of these drugs? And I'll explain why it's important. So first of all, complement is an element of innate immunity. What is innate immunity? Well, when we talk about T cells and B cells and A gamma globulinemia, uh, we're talking about acquired immunity. That is, you make a response to a vaccine or to an infection, and you become immune. But every animal that goes way back has to protect itself from infection. And acquired immunity, what we just talked about, only arises in evolution at about the level of the fish. So people, animals that are more primitive than fish don't make antibodies. They don't make B cells and T cells. That's something that, that, that evolution learned to do as you develop. But there are all kinds of things to keep you from getting infection. So all animals have the skin, and that skin keeps the, the, the infection out. And then they have all this long list of cells that helps prevent infection. They have receptors on those cells. They have things inside the cells that they can pour out on the infectious agent to kill it, and they have various factors. And we can talk about that if anybody has any questions, but you can see you can spend two hours talking about that. Now, this is a slide that deals with the issue that I was just dealing with. So, if you take very primitive animals, um, they basically have immunity, but they can't make antibody. Until you get to the level of the fish, you don't have the ability to make antibody. But there are much more primitive creatures. I'm showing a horseshoe crab here. I'm so showing a sea urchin. They protect themselves from infection. And these proteins that we talked about, the complement proteins, are present in all of these animals. The reason that a mosquito does not get killed by a malaria organism is complement. Now, complement's been known for 100 years. It's actually been known longer than adaptive immunity. And people were only interested in one particular question. What does complement do to protect you against infection, including bacterial infection? And what we learned, and, and <laughs> there's a man at this meeting called Hans Ox. I just wrote a chapter for him on the history of complement. And so this history starts in 1890. But what we learned during this, this uh, century was that complement basically does 
three things to protect you from infection. The first is it's learned to poke holes in the surface of cells, and this shows a hole like a cork borer being poked in a bacterium. That's the first thing it does. The second thing it's learned to do is to deposit pieces of itself, protein fragments, on the surface of the organism. That matches up with receptors on phagocytic cells. They can hold on to this bacterium, swallow it, and kill it. And the third thing it does is it basically gets activated, pieces come off, and those pieces tell these cells how to behave. So this is uh, a cell called a, a neutrophil. It actually changes its direction and it migrates toward the bacterium that's activated complement. It changes its shape and it's in better shape to kill that bacterium. We've known this for a good part of this, hundred, this century. Now, I had to deal with the question of how does complement work in viral diseases? And the way people study this is they take a mouse that's missing one complement protein or another, and they infect it with a virus or a bacterium that they know how it works, and they look to see if the animal dies faster. That's the end of the research. And in five minutes, I was able to put together this list of, of, of uh, viruses, etc. Now, the interesting about, thing about this is nobody's interested in it. Uh, this is not an area of hot research in America at the present time. The reason is, as I said, everybody's got complement. It's almost never that somebody's missing one of these proteins, and so an infectious disease specialist doesn't really have to worry about it. He knows it's going to, the system's okay. He knows, he knows vaguely that the system, if it's not okay, is a problem, but he knows that his patient's chance of having a problem is infinitely small, and so he doesn't worry about it. So here is an idea of how complement works, experiment that we did a long time ago, and this has to do with pneumococci, which is uh, the organism that causes pneumonia in many of our kids. If you take pneumococci, and this was done in a rabbit, uh, no, guinea pig, and you actually inject the pneumococci into the blood of the animal, it gets cleared very quickly, there's a little period of recrudescence, there's definitive clearance. If you've done something to the complement system, it starts to get cleared, it overgrows, and it kills the animal. So I can prove to you that complement is very important. I can prove to you that it's important in all those infections. And what we'll talk about in a little while is that I can prove to you that it's important in a large number of diseases in man, and I can't prove to you that any drug companies are interested. Uh, so uh, this is the picture I showed you before. I just uh, put in a slide to show you one, two, and three. So one was the hole. And this is uh, a picture of a, of, a, uh, of, a, of a surface. And you can see the cork borer very clearly. It's actually clearer in the bottom picture. You can see that the complement has oriented itself into, in the surface. And it's just like a cork borer. Things can go right through the center. Uh, and of course, the organism can't keep itself alive with its inside and outside in contact, and it dies. So that was number one. Number two is obstinization. Here are cells, red cells in this case, coated with complement, and they stick to the cell in the middle because it has complement receptors. This is one step in the phagocytic process, and the second step uh, causes the, or the, the red cells to go inside. So that's the second job that complement does. And the third job, I said, is that it causes chemotaxis. It causes things to come toward where the complement is being generated. That's number three. And here's an example of this uh, happening. In this blood vessel, immune complexes have been allowed to activate complement, and you can see all the white cells crowding in. Now, were you to give this to a human pathologist, he would say, this is vasculitis. So in fact, in many cases, vasculitis is caused by complement. Again, nobody studies this. Now, there are three pathways of complement activation that have been described. This is not my slide, but it makes a point. There's something called the classical pathway. Remember, we talked about C1 and C1 inhibitor and hereditary angioedema. And the reason this is called the classical pathway is people started studying it in 1890. They didn't know that there were any other pathways until much more recent times. Now, I've reassorted this slide. Uh, 
uh, in the next slide, and it's going to make it confusing, and I'm sorry. I tried to straighten it out in such a way that, that things would flow from one to another, and it, it looked like it was going to take me many, many more hours than it was worth. Uh, but basically, there are proteins that get activated in the system that cause the kinds of things that we just talked about. So this is a, a, uh, uh, a slide that I made, and you can see it's a hell of a lot more confusing. But here again is the classical pathway, uh, and this is the C1 that we talked about, and we talked about it cleaving C4 and that being used as a diagnostic test for hereditary angioedema. And the only other point that I want to make, and anybody has a question? Yeah. Finish what you have. Okay. Is that a series of proteins are in your blood? Every single person in this room has every single one of these proteins. Um, and almost nobody missing anything. Uh, and it goes through C3, 5, there's a protein called C6, C7, C8, C9, and when you get to the end, you get to that cork borer and you get lysis. The, the uh, C3 is the main protein that causes what is called opsonization, putting those little fragments on the cells so that they start the phagocytic process that we talked about. And the third one is chemotaxis, and that's C5. Um, now, what was your question? Sure. So, okay, so let's, so that's the classical pathway. And the, as I said, the reason it was called the classical pathway is people asked the question in 1890 when they first discovered antibody, what does antibody do? And they couldn't find antibody doing anything until there was fresh serum around, and that fresh serum contained complement, and they started to work out this pathway, and they called it the classical pathway. Now, it turns out in evolution, the classical pathway works with antibody, and antibody, as I said, is a, a relatively recent development in evolution, and it turns out the classical pathway is not evolutionarily old. The two old pathways are the one at the top called the lectin pathway and the one at the bottom called the alternative pathway. Let's take the alternative pathway first because it's easier to explain. The alternative pathway has that brilliant name because people discovered it and said, hey, it's an alternative pathway. <laughs> <laughs> so, so... So it's a pathway that comes in at the level of C3. It uses its own series of proteins, which are exactly analogous to the proteins of the classical pathway. Uh, and it's a different pathway that comes in at the level of C3. And it has some differences. The first one is that it's evolutionarily old. It's one of these pathways that goes way, way back, and it doesn't require antibody. It would have to not require antibody, since antibody hadn't evolved at the time that the pathway evolved. And the lectin pathway was the last pathway to be discovered. Um, and it was discovered when people found that there were ways that the, that the complement pathway could be activated by just things like yeast and bacteria. Uh, and when they started to look, they found this very old pathway, doesn't require antibody, uses, again, a series of proteins, which we can talk about, that join the classical pathway, that continue along the classical pathway uh, to give you all of the biological features. Now, you'll notice that all three pathways are together at the level of C3, and all three pathways are together at the level of all the proteins after C3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So they can all cause lysis in the right circumstances. If you pick up a textbook at the present time, you'll see that all three pathways do this, the same thing. One of the focuses of my research is to prove that, in fact, they don't all this, do the same thing. And we can talk about that, but it's certainly not something that we're going to develop an understanding of here. As I said, this is complicated. And now it gets more complicated. And the reason is, suppose you decided that you're going to kill things in your house. And suppose you decided that you're going to use a bottle of nitroglycerin to kill some mice. And you're going to keep three or four bottles of nitroglycerin around the house. You probably would think that you want to spend some time thinking about how to prevent them from blowing up. Uh, that you probably want to figure out how to turn this thing off. I showed you a bunch of ways in which complement kills things. I showed you it plokes holes in things. I showed you it opsonizes things. I showed you it causes chemotaxis. Now, it turns out that there are a fair number of diseases in man in which complement is doing exactly that. 
So if you happen to be one of the unlucky people who develops autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and uh, uh, Kathleen Sullivan is going to talk about some of the patients uh, with, with uh, immunodeficiency who do develop autoimmune hemolytic anemia. It's often complement that's causing the autoimmune hemolytic anemia. It's coating your red cells. They're sticking to phagocytes that recognize the complement fragments and swallowing them. Uh, and so, in fact, you got yourself a problem. The system is doing what it's supposed to do, but it's not supposed to be killing your own cells. So you have a very large number of ways of turning it off. And that's shown on this slide. And we started to think about the ways of turning it off really only in the last decade. So everything in red and green on this slide is a way of turning it off. And there are as many ways of turning it off as there are of turning it on. So we talked about C1 inhibitor when we talked about hereditary angioedema. It actually turns off both the lectin pathway and the classical pathway, although that has nothing to do with the pathophysiology of hereditary angioedema. But then there are all these other proteins that turn off the complement system. Some of them are in your plasma, and the ones in green are actually attached to your cells. Uh, and they all turn off the complement pathway. And the lightning bolts are places where the, 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 the proteins, if they land on something, are only stable for a few minutes. If they continue the complement cascade, it goes. If they don't continue the complement cascade, they degrade and, in fact, go downhill. And you can see there are lots of places where this system can be turned off. Now, it turns out that Although we are, have patients missing complement proteins, they're extraordinarily rare. I said 23 in Europe. But there are a lot of people who have a problem with turning things off. And that turns out to be much more common than we knew. I put in some slides about the, the various uh, complement pathways, and probably they're less interesting uh, than some of the other things that we can talk about. But I'll go through them very quickly. Uh, this is the classical pathway. I talked about C1. Here is a picture of C1Q that attaches to the antibody. It has a central uh, stalk. It has little places here that attach to the antibody, and it continues the complement cascade. You asked about the lectin pathway. Here is the protein that turns on the lectin pathway, and here is C1Q. They look an awful lot alike. The only difference is that this one recognizes antibody. I said that antibody uh, has evolved at the time that this pathway evolves. This one doesn't recognize antibody because it evolved before antibody, so it has these little things at the end that recognize sugars, and so it recognizes various sugars on the surface of organisms like yeast and some bacteria, and it starts off the complement cascade. This is less efficient than actually recognizing antibody. And so, in fact, this pathway has become vestigial, basically. It's not as important a pathway. And we're still only working it out. This pathway was only rediscovered in the 1990s. And in the year 2000 and, and 2015, exactly what it does, we still don't know. So we talked about the classical pathway antibody usually required. Uh, we developed a line of guinea pigs years ago, missing C4. And the reason that I wanted to present these animals to you is that the same discovery has been made in mice missing C4, and Hans Ox, who's at these meetings, did a very limited number of patients missing C4. That's a very hard experiment to do. I've never seen a patient missing C4. And that means that the ones that are discovered are almost always sick. But if you, if you look at animals missing C4, you find animals missing C1, C4, C3, all have a defect in their ability to make antibody. And remember, that's the pathway that evolves at the time the antibody uh, uh, evolves. This is our guinea pigs missing C4. And Hans Ox has a, a method of giving a particular antigen to animals or people. We use it in children. Uh, and what happens when you give this antigen as a vaccine, uh, basically they make antibody. Uh, over weeks, the antibody declines slightly. You boost them. That is, you give a second shot of the antigen. This particular experiment was done at seven weeks. And you get a secondary response, which is IgG. And this is a log scale. This is much higher. And it comes down. This is what happens every time you give a vaccine. 
to a child. If you do it in an animal that's missing complement, we discovered years ago that the animal makes a response which is really a tenth, the normal response, and then it doesn't hold on. It goes back down to zero, stays at zero, you boost the animal seven weeks later, it makes a response that looks like the first response. We know that this is true. We know that it's true in guinea pigs, we know it's true in dogs, we know it's true in mice, uh, and in the very few people that we have been studied, it looks like it's true in humans. I'm not going to go through. That's missing that pro just one protein, C4. As I said, I've never seen a patient missing C4. They're described, but I'm a complement expert. I've never, ever seen a patient. Uh, I've never seen a patient missing C1Q. I've only seen one patient in my life missing C3. So we're talking about very rare deficiencies. <laughs> what? C3. You're missing C3? Yeah, it's really low all the time. That's different from missing it, but we'll talk at the end of the... Yeah, we'll talk about it. Um, because remember, you have two C3 genes, and one of them can be abnormal. We'll talk about that at, before, at the end of the session. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these complement pathways. People still are not sure of what the lectin pathway does. There are paper. First of all, it's not being studied in America, I think, by anybody at the present time. That's the, well, <laughs> that's the first thing. It is being studied by the Europeans who have worked on it. Um, and in fact, they claim uh, that the incidence of infection in little babies is a little bit higher in people missing uh, this lectin pathway. Remember, this is a vestigial pathway, uh, and there are a fair number of people uh, who have very low levels of proteins in the lectin pathway. Um, and it's not clear that they're at risk for anything. Again, there's a question of do they have an increased risk of rheumatologic disease, this woman is low on C3. The usual level of C3 in the circulation is 1.2 milligrams per mil. The usual level of, of uh, the first protein in the in lectin pathway is a thousandth that. And you have to have nanogram levels before they say it's low. So in fact, we're talking about a protein that circulates at a thousandth the level of C3 and we don't really know exactly what it does. There are more and more papers saying it does something important, but important, and it probably does, but it's not so easy to study. Uh, and as I say, the popularity of this area is not so great. Infectious disease people don't worry about it. They think people who have uh, lectin pathway deficiencies are perfectly normal, and nobody would ever think about replacing it. So in fact, uh, it's not studied. Uh, this is, uh, is the, the lectin picture I showed you before. The alternative pathway does not require antibody. It has proteins. Uh, for the purpose of this slide, I showed you that the proteins are analogous to the proteins of the classical pathway. We don't have to go into that in detail. But the, protein, the alternative pathway is very primitive, gets activated, and is probably most involved in things like the development of arthritis, in the development of kidney disease. It's probably most involved in the development of immunopathology. That is all of the bad things that happen uh, when, when your immune system goes awry. So it's important, but as I say, getting a company to actually work on this stuff is not so easy. Uh, but at the end of the talk, I'll talk about the one drug that has come along that is useful in com There's only one drug. It's a monoclonal antibody. We talked about what a monoclonal antibody is. It's a monoclonal antibody to C5. Uh, and you can give this drug to people who have some diseases, which we can talk about, um, and it turns off their C5. What that means is it turns off everything after C5, which means it turns off lysis. This is a company called Alexion. It sells the drug for a half a million dollars a year. It's turned out to be life-saving for some diseases. And since they're making a fair amount of profit on this drug, uh, they're trying it in other diseases like graft rejection. And it's turning out to be useful in those diseases as well. But nobody would have known it until they developed the protein. As I said, it's the only protein that's currently available for treatment of a complement disorder. So we talked about all of this. That's C5. That's C5. So what does C5 do? 
C5 gets cleaved, like all the complement proteins, into a big piece and a little piece. The little piece is called C5A, and it acts as an anaphylatoxin. What does that mean? Well, if you give a big slug of it to an animal, the animal dies. It looks like anaphylaxis. It's the principal chemotactic factor, the thing that makes those, those cells come into the vessel I showed you, a vessel filled uh, with white cells. It upregulates so-called adhesion molecules uh, that allows uh, things to stick together. It makes the cells make cytokines, which improves the immune response and can increase uh, immunopathology, and it causes mast cells to degranulate, and that's why it's an anaphylatoxin. When mast cells degranulate en masse, you get something called anaphylaxis because they release a whole bunch of stuff that can kill you. That's what an asth asthmatic attack is, mast cells degranulating uh, and releasing all these factors. Yeah, we're doing time wise. We're doing okay. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a human being, uh, and we've injected C5A into the skin, and you can see something that looks like a hive. And, the, and it itches like mad. And in fact, if you were to biopsy it, which we did, it's filled with white cells. So in fact, it's part of the allergic response. Turns out it's important in a lot of other things that people are just starting to work out. But again, the number of people doing this kind of stuff is very small. This is something that was done 25 years ago. This is called a Boyden chamber. And what they do is they put a, a millipore filter here in the chamber. They can put C5A down here. It's at the bottom of the chamber. They can put white cells at the top of the chamber, and they can see what happens. And in fact, if you put white cells at the top of the chamber and just buffer at the bottom, those white cells start to migrate through the millipore filter. But if you put C5A down here, they go through much faster. They go to the bottom of the filter. They start to drop off. And so you can see chemotaxis in action. In fact, this was a popular experiment 25 years ago. I've never even seen anybody doing it anymore. Uh, if you take an animal, uh, this is a normal lung, and you give it an enormous slug of C5A, this is the vessel in the rabbit's lung, and in fact the rabbit dies. Now how was this discovered? Very interesting. Um, it turns out that there was a group in Minnesota that was interested in, not in complement at all, uh, they were interested in heart-lung membranes. They were interested in ki kidney dialysis membranes. And a certain proportion of their patients were getting terribly sick with, with uh, lung disease during the attack. And so what happened was that, that uh, they started to figure out what's going on. And what they figured out was that these very primitive complement pathways that recognize sugars were recognizing the dialysis membrane activating complement and in causing this pulmonary problem in people. So the problem was discovered in people. It was worked out in people. And then we went back to animals, so these people were not interested in complement at all. But they really did figure out that they have to worry about complement in dialysis membranes and heart-lung machine membranes. And so that's all tested at the present time. And people have worked out ways of preventing it. We've talked about uh, the, the C5A to five to nine. There are a few people missing five to nine, almost nobody missing any of the other proteins uh, in, in the classical alternative pathway. In fact, there are some proteins in the alternative pathway and then no one has ever been found to be missing. Uh, but in fact, if you're missing five to nine, you can get meningococcal or gonococcal infection, and so that's been noted. Um, I'm still, tr I'm trying very hard to go through this in a way that's very meaningful. Uh, but and I'm having mixed, oh, I know why. Okay, now this is a picture of antibody being deposited in somebody's kidneys. It's a disease called glomerulonephritis. And we've known about this disease for 50 years, but nobody knows what causes glomerulonephritis. Nobody knows for sure how to treat glomerulonephritis. It's really been a mystery. Often this is complement in the kidney, and this is the kidney of somebody with lupus. So in fact, nobody knows what causes lupus, and nobody knows for sure how to treat lupus. We give people steroids, we give people things to kill their B cells so that they don't make antibody, but nobody knows for sure how to treat it. And all of a sudden, things have started to clarify. One of the things that turned out to be interesting is that patients who are missing the proteins of the classical pathway 
that I've circled that basically arise at the time, well, they start to arise at the time that antibody arises, but they're in, intimately involved with antibody. If you're one of the few people missing one of those proteins, and I mean missing, I don't mean low, low level, um, you have a very high incidence of autoimmune disease. In fact, I've never seen a patient missing C1Q deficiency, but almost 100% of the people that have been described missing C1Q deficiency have, have severe lupus, very severe lupus. 75% of the people with C4 deficiency have severe lupus. Now, we're talking about less than 100 people. We're talking about almost nobody. And how do you find these people? Well, it turns out that you go to places where people marry their cousins. Uh, basically, uh, it's, you, you don't find it in the American population. Uh, and as you can see, the other factors are not associated with autoimmunity. So what does all that mean? God knows. Um, and I, I'll, I'll just skip this slide because it basically says the same thing. Now, this is a very complicated slide, and I'm not going to spend time with it. It was just published in, as you can see, uh, actually it was published in 2013, so it's not very old. But it makes the point that complement is made by certain cells. And if those cells, if you, you, um, uh, if you have complement, and the cells have the appropriate receptors for C3A and C5A, Lots of cells have those receptors. We talked about the fact that if C3A and C5A binds to mast cells, they degranulate. So if the cells have the appropriate receptors, they go ahead and make an immune response. If the cells have figured out how to get rid of the receptors, and it turns out that cells can figure out how to get rid of their receptors, you turn off the immune response. Now this has been published, as I say, the most recent paper was in 2012. I can tell you that if I go to the Department of Immunology uh, at Duke University or almost other, any other Department of Immunology, they don't even know what I'm talking about. So in fact, this is very recent stuff, but it may have a tremendous impact in the near future. Now we talked about anti-C5 and we said that it's approved by the FDA. Uh, it's in all kinds of phase tr two trials uh, and basically it works very well in a group of patients who are missing this particular factor, which works at the very end of the complement cascade. This is just one protein. It's called CD59, and it turns off complement at the very last step before lysis. Turns out there are a few people missing CD59. It's an acquired defect. It's not, it's not inherited. You can't live if it's inherited. There's only one person ever been described with it. But in fact, there are a group of people who develop hemologic disease in their bone marrow who lose the CD59. You can lose lots of different things on your cells in the bone marrow. And if you lose CD59, you lose the ability to turn off lysis. And that's what the uh, echolizumab does. It turns things off at this point here, so they never get to CD59. It turns out to be life-saving in those patients. So those patients who have a terrible disease uh, pay a half a million dollars a year, they get CD59, they get their complement system turned off, and their cells don't lice. That's important. As I said, it's being tested in a lot of other diseases. Now, we've talked about all these control factors. And as people have learned more and more about genetics, they've learned more and more about these control factors. And so I wanted to make a point. This on the left is a series of amino acids like M&Ms, all different colors, in a chain. And that chain associates into a complex structure, which is the way your proteins work. And I showed you a picture earlier of uh, hereditary angioedema of, C of C1 inhibitor, very complex protein with swiggles and turns and all things connected to one another. Now, suppose you're not missing this protein. But suppose this green uh, circle turns to a different pro uh, amino acid, it's blue. One of the things that can happen is you don't make the protein anymore. It, tur it turns out that that's such a, a lethal change that in fact the protein is not made. It turns out that that doesn't happen in complement very often. What happens is that the protein works, but it doesn't work quite as well as it used to work. So you still wind up with this 
a very complex protein, but there's one spot in it that's not working quite as well. And it turns out that people have, the, have uh, evolved in such a way that a lot of those control proteins that we talked about uh, can be abnormal. Again, very complex slide. I don't know how to make it simple. But there's a disease called atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is in children, which is a kidney and hemolytic disease. And people were interested in trying to figure out what in the world that was all about. And now you can do very complex genetic analyses. And when they did that, what they found was that things that turn off C3, I'm sorry, hard to do it without a good pointer. Here is C3. These factors, as I told you before, turn off C3. Anything that turns off C3 that's not working right and some of these factors turn off C3, will allow C3 to be more active. And if C3 is more active, you wind up with it de depositing in your glomerulus, and in fact, you can get hemolytic uremic syndrome, your kidneys get destroyed. On the other hand, it turns out that some of those tiny little changes make some of these proteins more active. And in fact, there are some people walking around who have turned out to have these one tiny little amino acid changes and their factor B, for example, became more active. And particularly, if these factors allow one of your proteins to become more active, and another change allows one of the inhibitors to become less active, these are tiny changes. But in fact, you've suddenly got yourself a disease. Uh, now, the people who discovered this really were not interested in complement. They were interested in these diseases. And one of the most interesting facts is that, that the... To, to determine whether all this stuff is working normally requires a tremendous amount of work. Think about it, all the genetic changes you have to study. Because, in fact, if you investigate a typical patient, these are all mutation screenings, I'm sorry, these are all mutation screenings for things that turn off or turn on complement. These are protein levels that you really have to do. There's an awful lot of work that has to be done to determine whether a patient has one of these abnormalities, and almost nobody's in position to do it. In fact, there's only one laboratory in America that will do this for you. And it's run by a guy who's a professor of otolaryngology at a school in the Midwest. Well, why in the hell would a patient of otolaryngology set up to do all these mutations, particularly since he didn't have any interest in complement? And the answer was his kid developed the disease. So, in fact, he had to find somebody to do it. I, I get, I'm very uh, emotional. Uh, and anyway, he does all these things. But it costs a lot of money. So what do you do? Well, he'll do it as a favor for a few people, but he won't do it for everybody. So, it turns out that if you... Now, there's a disease in man called uh, macular degeneration of the elderly. And macular degeneration of the elderly is, again a disease that causes blindness. It's the most common cause of blindness in the elderly. And there's nobody, really, there had been no understanding of this disease. Now, again, nobody in America was interested in complement, but a lot of people were interested in doing genetic screening. And so, in fact, they started to screen families of patients with macular degeneration of the elderly. And what they found was, and Four papers got published in the same month, a tyrosine 402 to histidine in one of the complement regulatory factors. And that seemed to be associated with 50% of macular degeneration of the elderly. As they started to study people with macular degeneration of the elderly, they found the same set of defects, again, tiny amino acid changes, in a lot of the proteins that control complement activation. That was discovered probably five or six years ago, and people are still trying to figure out how that works. But they know this. They know that in this, let's just look at this side. They know that this is complement deposited in the so-called macula, the place that, that gives you the sharpest vision. And this complement deposited in macular degeneration of the elderly. Exactly why it got there is not clear, 
But it is clear that the factor H, for example, is one of the factors that leads to control of that activation. And all of these other defects they're finding are the same defects that they're finding in, uh, in uh, uh, glomerulonephritis. Now, as they've looked at more common kinds of glomerulonephritis, they're also finding complement defects. Now, do you call this an immunodeficiency? It's not immunodeficiency in the sense that we've been talking about, that they're talking about next door. I mean, they're talking about a gene defect uh, in, the, in the ability to handle microorganisms that leads to chronic granulomatous disease. Or they're talking about a gene defect that leads to Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome. They're talking about a gene defect that leads to loss of a gene. And it's a lot easier to find a gene defect that leads to a loss of disease. Now we're talking about a gene defect that leads to a tiny amino acid change. Uh, and that tiny amino acid change, if it's a present and some of your other proteins have a tiny amino acid change, you've got a problem. How do you correct the problem? Well, it's not clear at the present time, and people are just working this out at the present, as I said. As I said, there's only one company that's bothered to even make a drug to, co to control the complement activation side if the control downregulation is abnormal. And that's Alexion, which makes anti-C5. It's the only company. Alexion is a good stock. Uh, it has really done very well. Uh, another guy who was the head of, of uh, rheumatology at Colorado got a great idea. He said, suppose I take some of these complement control proteins and hook them up with something that will bring them to the site of, of um, where, the, where the damage is taking place, like arthritis. Will that help? And the answer is it does. Uh, and again, it, the Alexion studies have been done in people now. The arthritis studies and the glomerulonephritis studies have only been done in mice. This guy quit his job for one year. He took a leave of absence. He started a company. And guess what? Alexion bought the company. Uh, and so maybe we'll find out uh, something more in the near future. But there's a lot of opportunity here and a lot of opportunity that companies are afraid to put money into to sort of test out. Alexion's been the only company that's taken a chance um, I suspect that we'll see some more in the future. But this is an area of immunodeficiency, which you won't hear about in any other sessions. And so it's, uh, uh, it's I think, of interest, uh, and it's certainly of interest to me. Now, if you have a complement genetic defect, no protein, you have a complement titer of zero, we won't get into that. Multiple proteins low, we think about an acquired defect, and that is if your C3 is low, your C4 is low, uh, we'll, we can talk about your C3 being low. Um, and then there are useful tests that look for genetic deficiencies. The problem is that with regulatory deficiencies, it's much harder to diagnose. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, we still don't have a good system in place in America for doing that. In case you have C1 inhibitor deficiency, uh, you're in Fat City because in fact, we know exactly what to do. And all these diseases on this chart are in some way related to complement. We know that all these diseases are associated with complement activation. We know that people with rheumatoid arthritis have activated complement in their joint fluid. We know that people with, with uh, uh, dermatomyositis and certain kinds of encephalitis have complement activation. We know the myasthenia gravis is due to complement activation. Um, Alzheimer's le lesions do have complement deposited. Nobody's sure what that means. Um, and uh, you can look down this long list. It's a long list. There are no drugs to control any one of the steps on this list at the present time. Uh, and no near future drugs, except in the renal diseases, where suddenly the, the nephrologist is saying, hey, wait a minute, maybe we missed the boat. So I have the last slide. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, and I'm open for questions.